So here's an example, I'll give you an example of osteotomy and preparation for total knee, the first half of the talk. So first off, the uh, collaboration between the Joint Service and I did uh, produce a paper. And it's a, kind of a nice paper in JAAOS, and uh, Peter Skulko put it together, and we assisted and, and gave cases. But uh, the management of extraarticular deformity in the setting of knee arthroplasty. So it's a, it's a nice reference to refer to. JAAOS, right? It does mostly review articles now, original articles too, but this is a review article, so it's, it's kind of a fun one to read. And it kind of goes over a lot of the topics that we're going to discuss today, like how much can you correct acutely with a knee replacement? When should you correct extraarticular deformity before the knee replacement? How extraarticular does it need to be before you correct it? So interesting stuff. So here's a patient, 51 years old. Um, she's a, a waitress, so I call that a high-impact profession. She's on her feet all day long, carrying heavy loads and pounds on her leg. So she had this malunion from an accident when she was younger, and now her knee's gone on to develop post-traumatic arthritis, and she needs a knee replacement. She has a lot of knee pain, but it's going to be really hard to do a knee replacement with this underlying deformity. And you can kind of imagine, gee, where would I put my cuts for a knee replacement um, if I just ignored the deformity? So you could physically do it. But what would the wear pattern be on my knee replacement with this huge translational deformity underneath my my uh, my tray? So, you know, would it loosen up? Uh, even if the mechanical axis is straight, there's some funky forces. And we have the technology to fix this. So um, I got involved and uh, did a correction through the malunion using gradual correction technique with the hexapod frame, using the same kind of planning that Mitch just showed us and, you know, the, the frame just takes it through space and corrects it. Now, how does it correct it? Well, you, the patient, is trained how to turn the struts. But coming now, we have automatically adjusting struts that are really cool. So that's another option, is you can put in struts that adjust themselves, and the patient does less. So one, the patient can be lazy and do less. But... What's more interesting about it is the regenerate, we're expecting to be better because it's a slower process, uh, more gradual, and it's actually less painful. That's what we've, that's the reports we've heard from patients so far, but lots of options here, and um, the correction's done, right? So now she can get her knee replacement. Uh, what happens? Well, often when you correct a deformity in, a, in a, an arthritic joint, the patient actually has a lot less pain and gets back on with life and postpones the knee replacement. So she wanted to hold off on her knee replacement. Two and a half years, she was back at work full time and eventually the knee started to hurt a lot again and she went ahead and got her knee replacement. So let's look at this. Is this a stemmed, hinged implant, right? Ready for all sorts of horrible forces? No, this is a simple knee replacement. This will last her the normal expected lifetime of a knee replacement, and then she can get a standard revision knee replacement. So we got her on track to a normal knee replacement with you know, an, an excellent expectation for outcome for her replacement. So that's, that's a big, oh, one other point. She had an external fixator here, right? Did she get osteomyelitis and an infected knee replacement? No, this is a couple of years out. She has had no signs of infection. And we're really not too worried about that. The incidence of infection is very low in our hands in the sense that I don't, I haven't had one in a patient who got a knee replacement after having a modern external fixator with HA coated pin. I don't think Rob has ever seen one. So there's a very legitimate concern if you've had an external fixator in the zone of where your knee replacement will go that you're going to get an infection. It's contraindicated to use an external fixator, and it's just not true. Another example. Here's a 58-year-old active patient with a foot drop. So here's a pretty major malunion of the femur, and anytime there's a large translational deformity in the femur and I'm considering doing an acute correction, I like to know what I'm dealing with with regard to the vessels, right? Um, in addition, you know, to try to do a correction with a circular frame in the femur, in the proximal femur, 
is sort of an interesting exercise, but it's torturing the patient, literally just torturing them. So better to do this with an internal implant. And the patient did have a leg length discrepancy as well. So first of all, we get a, a CTA, make sure that that profunda artery is not like right in the osteotomy site to make sure it's safe. And you can see that there's some space there between the vessel and the bone, although it's close. So um, I deducted that we'd be okay doing this big translational acute move and an, osteot an osteotomy if it's done um, safely under fluoroscopy. Put in a lengthening nail, so a correction of the underlying deformity, which will, again, give predictable wear patterns for the knee replacement. And then a uh, limb lengthening with the internal implant in order to get the leg length corrected, because once the knee replacement's in, it's a little harder to do that. Um, and then he goes on to get his knee replacement. Again, there was a delay of about two years before getting the knee replacement. You can see some of the planning here that my colleague did for the knee replacement. It was very straightforward at this point. And here's another one. Here's a guy who um, is a construction worker. He's 60, but he still works full time. He's a foreman, so he's not like lifting that much heavy stuff. He's mostly directing everyone. Loves his work, doesn't want to stop, but he can barely walk at this point. And if you just do a knee replacement here, again, like what would those cuts look like? What would your tibial cut look like? It wouldn't be pretty. I mean, we can, we can <laughs> go ahead and figure that out. You'd have to completely release the MCL, use a big hinge. I don't do knee replacement, but I'm just, you know, or cut a lot off the lateral side. This would be a disaster. So here's a better one to fix pre-replacement. Same idea. We do the planning Mitch talked about, a strong external fixator. Um, this is a big guy, and he's 60. So... You can see the difference. This is an up spec fixator, right? Four rings, lots of fixation. I'm expecting that his healing is going to be a little slower. So we give him a real strong fixator. And then he's healed. He hasn't gotten his knee replacement. And in fact, he's back at work and says, I don't want a knee replacement. Like, I'm good. <laughs> so uh, sometimes that happens. What about after knee replacement? Well, um, the wear patterns in knee replacement are greatly affected by malalignment. Um, here's a patient who's 61, uh, had a knee replacement performed, and the surgeon decided that, hey, I don't really need to deal with this malunion thing. I'm just going to put the knee in, and we'll be good. No worries. So there's the alignment, and it hasn't changed since the knee replacement. The patient did have a fracture, which was fixed, and actually, if anything, put the patient into a little bit of valgus when the fracture was fixed. And here we are with varus alignment, knee pain, and the, the idea is that uh, the knee surgeon feels this person probably needs a revision, but doesn't, doesn't want to make the same mistake twice, doesn't want to do the revision surgery until the malalignment's corrected. Place and also has a leg length discrepancy. So in this case, again, acute correction, lengthening nail, let's, let's get rid of the malunion, let's uh, equalize the leg lengths, and then the patient can go ahead and get a revision, hopefully, the patient will have less pain after the uh, correction and won't need a revision, but um, if they do need a revision, then we're set for that, right? And then this should be the last one, uh, malunion of a, of a patient with an osteoarthritic knee. Uh, patient had a malunion, developed osteoarthritis, had the knee replacement despite the malunion, right? Again, a warning, don't do this. You can fix the malalignment. So you can see how, like, if you just put an intermedullary guide in to do your, to your femoral cut, that's how you end up with this, right? At least do an extramedullary guide if you have a femoral malunion. How about that? 64-year-old um, professional bartender on his feet all day, all night. So his knee's also in a lot of flexion. You can see where that, that uh, femoral component. So also probably needs a revision. But, I mean, look at the, look at the sagittal. I mean, what a disaster. So... They were trying to make up for this recurvatum deformity and putting the, the component in flexion. Um, in the planning, when you use IM nail planning, you plan your blocking screws because that really dictates where your nail is going to go. So again, the idea here is the femur. I really don't want to put rings on. I'm going to use an intermedullary type approach, correct the malunion, and then um, correct the leg length discrepancy uh, if I need to. <laughs> this patient didn't perceive a leg length discrepancy, and mainly he said, 
I need to be back at work ASAP. I'm not going through a lengthening and missing six months of work. Forget that. I want to be full weight bearing immediately. So we said, okay, we'll forget about your leg on the and see where shoe lift. We'll just do an acute correction. And this is how, so pre-op planning. So Mitch showed you hexapod pre-op planning. This is more typical pre-op planning for internal implants. And acute correction with blocking screws. So the femur is straight, but his replacement is still crooked. And that's not because the femoral alignment's wrong. So he's, again, he's optimized for revision surgery. Um, that's the idea. So again, here's more hexapod. 73-year-old, knee pain, leg length discrepancy. Again, someone does the knee replacement despite this malalignment, and patient still has a leg length discrepancy, um, has issues with the knee replacement, has knee pain, the implant's not loose, so, you know, they're kind of in a constant state of flexion, and uh, it is a pathological state. So the best way to correct this, again, we're back to the tibia. Tibias do really well with external fixation. Can you put an external fixator on somebody with an implant? Yes, you can. You just keep a nice zone away from the implant. So you're not putting, you're not going to get a pin infection into your stem. Uh, you can get more close than this, but this is the safest way to go. And so the whole, the whole uh, frame is kept distal. Uh, we do a gradual correction. Even with a gradual correction, this patient healed very poorly. A lot of the a lot of patients who are getting knee replacements are obviously older. This one was in our uh, 70s, I think. Yeah, 73 years old. So I did the correction, got her out to length, got her alignment where I wanted it, and she just took forever to heal. So I went back and did iliac crest bone grafting. There's a tricortical wedge in there. There's cancellous graft around it. And that works great. She goes on to heal completely. That replacement should last her quite a long time now. And um, this is a good tactic uh, for these patients. It's a good tactic. It's safe. Um, you know, it is low rate of deep infection. Uh, and if you need to do bone grafting because your regenerate's poor, then that's fine. And Dan Prince is going to tell us more about that. And um, that is my talk. And we'll take questions at the end of the session. Um, Rob Roswick's up next. Limb length equalization.